Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I just want to repeat questions just because we're on camera. And I'm not sure if my mic's going to pick up everything. So your question was, how do you hook people? Are you captivating with intrigue or are you doing something else similar to dating? What are the similarities in terms of sales? So in terms of doing cold walk-ups and approaching people and developing a hook in terms of dating, if you're going out to a bar or club, nine out of 10 people in the bar or club are not approaching people. They're kind of just stuck in their soul circle. And I think that's totally cool because a lot of people and including in our company, we actually teach people how to maximize your own soul circle. And I think that's great. Now in terms of actually meeting people as you don't know, in terms of strangers, we actually have programs on that as well. In terms of your question, it's more in the latter. How do you develop that hook for intrigue when people don't really know you? Can you just pass out cards really quick? Well, you can, but you're not gonna get success. You have to have something that makes it sticky for why they wanna get in touch with you. A lot of people will just blindly pass out business cards to everyone and expect because they have a business card, everyone automatically is gonna call them or follow up, but nobody does. That's why I don't even have business cards. In fact, I'll get other people's business cards solely because I then can text them and follow up with them. I might say, hey, it was nice meeting you. You know, I'm saving your number in my phone because you know, like many people, I probably, you probably don't answer or recognize calls. But I want to follow up with you on this and this for business. If it was a business, like, hey, I, maybe I mentioned like a lunch or a dinner party. The thing is, I usually like to have a hook of some kind. So if it's intrigue through your personality or they want to get to know you socially, like you hooked on a particular topic, or you have just the same kind of friends and commonality or same kind of interests, just you know, follow up with them on a hook. Yep. But trying to find out what's interesting to them. If it's them interested in a social aspect of something, you know, get interested in that. Now, if it's a business thing or if it's something that, like that, you know, you can follow up with that as well. Like if they're actually interested in your product, but many times it's not. Most of the time it's, it's not. Most of the times it's developing relationships because you can develop a lot of relationships really fast. Like in one weekend, we'll have our clients maybe approach a hundred women in the night. And you'll also meet a lot of guys as well because you're in a bar or social environment. You're not just talking to the girls, you're also talking to your guy friends and other guys just having a good time, being the kind of person who gets in state. You have that social momentum. And when you're in that most more social environment and you're on fire, more engaging, more fun, more captivating, you're more likely to get other people interested. And so some for some people it takes a while to warm up. For other people it's just they're so used to doing it, they're doing it all the time. It's a skill that I didn't have. I was more of a a uh, more sheltered kind of guy who didn't really have a lot of friends going up. I, I wouldn't say that, because I used to say I was introverted-ish, because I've taken tests that have said that I was, because I like, prefer hanging out with my cats more than going out to a bar or club nowadays. But then again, I'm married. And, but I mean, even, even so, I'd still prefer to play video games. I was talking to a parent who has kids who were like, a, one of the kids was like a number 40 in the world at like Call of Duty or Halo. <laughs> And I, I mean, that's kind of cool. It's still social-ish, but still like you prefer to do those kind of things as opposed to socializing. But regardless whether you're an introvert or extrovert, the, the ability to connect with other people, you could still do it. You just need to connect with the hooks. I mean, some of the things I used to do was make a game out of it. One of the things I used to do in terms of like partying, my game, in order to force myself to have a hook to connect with people, because I didn't really know how to connect with people on the basis of who I was as a person. That wasn't the skills that I had. I just kind of did like the easiest training wheels possible, which, which was invite people to party. That's what I talked about earlier. Because if you don't have any personality, if you don't have any you know, humor or you don't have that fun vibe to you, you could always rely on, on that to be that fun vibe. <laughs> then I learned how to have 
I could write more interesting stories in my life. I would travel, do crazy adventures. I'd have a wide variety of things. I'd say yes to everything, so I'd have more conversational rapport. I traveled. You know, I traveled to 110 countries, and I was able to now, if someone said they're from a certain city, I could probably talk to them about it intelligently. I could talk to them about all sorts of things I've done in all research. I've always been involved in education. I think someone else was talking about how they're on the board of a, a charity, inspiring youth, how to you know, be uh, inspired and get some more success in life. My idea was education. The education can inspire other people, stories inspire other people. I think telling stories to captivate people and make them think they're a cool person also helps because then they're more likely to invite you to other things. Yeah, one of the things that is interesting is that when I, by the way, how I met Nick, if you guys want to know, he's, um, how did how, how we meet each other, Amber? We met at P.F. Chang's, okay, through my wife. P.F. Chang's, yeah. Amber actually used to be in my company. And uh, she would actually tell me about all kinds of different things about Nick and how he did this. And I was like, what? He does what? I didn't even understand. And uh, what was actually crazy about this is the fact that you meet one person that can really change everything for you. At that time, uh, I think I had, 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 was I in the game still? I think I had just sold my company, right? I just, I was actually out of that company and I had my own company that I was actually building and stuff like that. At that time, I think I was at about a million five a year and I thought I was doing really well this is you know and it was crazy like that was my monthly that was my yearly thing and stuff like that and I met Nick and he's like I'm doing this 10x type of thing than what you're doing and I'm like thinking I'm like the high speed guy in my even in my building right and that absolutely changed things for me because of the fact that when you meet somebody that you know that has a different caliber of friendships and has a different caliber of of a network and a net worth and stuff like that, then what you do is you kind of piggyback on that and that actually opens up your mind to something completely different. And I can tell you because of those relationships and because of that one dinner, that one thing, right? Now we've been friends for after many, many years and we share a lot of the same networks as well and stuff like that and uh, it, it becomes kind of like a world class type of friendship. And that's what people want to see from you. It's not so much, you know, who you know, who you are, but it's who you know, right? And one of the things that you should capitalize on, especially after you're, after, you know, after you're leaving meetings like this, is the fact that, hey, what if I told you that my company can get you socially connected to some of the most powerful people in the world, some of the most successful people in the world, that that's exactly one of the, one of the key things that they'll go ahead and buy into, right? It's like who you're connected to, right? Kind of like what I was saying yesterday. Maybe this makes it more sense to you today. Uh, Selena, you have a question? I do, yeah. Well, well, well let, me, let me also finish the, the answer to her also because I don't want to confuse something. I, I don't want these valuable gimmicks to be the hook, though. I say that's the trading wheels part of it. I think that what you need to do, though, is create a situation where it's not necessarily a persona that you're using these hooks. You want to convey the cool aspects of who you are and have like that wide rapport. Yeah. I mean, if you have deep rapport in something also, whether it's deep rapport or wide rapport, it's, it's cool. It's just that if you kind of finish that one aspect of deep rapport, say you're only talking about financial products, then bam, that relationship's over. If you have wide rapport, you have like, okay, cool, this person wants to, like, to go to my dinner parties or other parties or want to be a part of my mastermind group. They, they have similar topics and commonalities with my friends and family. We have cool, funny stories to share together. We laugh, we have drinks, and we have a good vibing with each other. Now you have wide rapport. Now wide rapport hooks people. In terms of the follow-up, a lot of people will use text messages to try to develop wide rapport, but they should do it in person. They just need to develop it fast. And that's what we call developing a sticky relationship, someone who's going to stick with you. Now, if you found out what their passions are, what they're most interested in, just through, through conversation, you can see how they light up on particular topics, whether you ask them directly about what their passions are or not. I prefer it to be more organic and just directly ask them, but you can. You know, what are they working on that they're most passionate about? It's that, that kind of question. Then you could kind of figure out how you can hook them and you could give them that thing that when they contact you, well, you're attacking their main passion. Then you could push things forward. But there's a lot of people who could help them potentially with that passion, whether it's you or them. So you don't want to be stuck on just helping them with that one passion. You want to be able to develop an overall wide rapport so you have a sticky relationship. And whether you're following up there that night, an hour later, a couple of days later or whatever, it doesn't really matter. I could follow up with somebody like five years later. If I developed a sticky relationship and they wrote a note in there, they'll remember me. It's the key to keeping yourself memorable because I've had people that I didn't stay in touch with for five years and then I ended up developing a relationship with that person that became really important in my life. Things like that, just by developing wide rapport and having that one, one memorable conversation. That memorable conversation doesn't need to last hours. It could last five, 10 minutes. You could bounce around, especially if you're in an event with a lot of powerful people. Cool.
So I've been divorced for 15 years, and so I've been dating for over a decade. So using your terminology, I've been playing the game for over about 10 years. <laughs> and I think it's interesting, though, that as demographics change, you know what I mean? Like, would you ever hire women as an executive coach? And how would you... you well, we have hired women in? as executive coaches. <laughs> you have? And so how would it... Because yours is like how to cultivate a red-hot social circle of beautiful women. So yeah. you can teach us how to... My wife has a program women. called Lavodica. It teaches girls how to catch them and keep them. And how to catch them and keep them, well, and how to. I don't even think catch them and keep them though, because I think honestly the demographics. Are she true. also has how to break up with the guy properly, or how to recover from breakups, are, but all, all the stuff. The consumers. Yeah. Women are more the consumers. Mm -hmm. Like all my girlfriends on on uh, what is it Tinder or something like that. Yeah. They're talking about where they're the consumer. Do you know what I mean? It's not. It maybe used to be you know 20 years ago where the guys were the consumers. But now it's women where we're like, we're a little bit more selective, do you know what I mean? So I don't think we're into, I think we're into catch and release. <laughs> <laughs> I teach you how to do that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so, that so what, what I would consider creating a program for women to cash them and release them. <laughs> well, I, I think that for a woman, it's, it's, it's going to be a lot easier for you. If you wanted to hook up with the guy and then release him, I think that you could do that pretty easily. Well, I think that every woman can. I think that I've changed business model to change like social demographics as, as social demographics are changing where women are more... We're very independent. You know what I mean. We're extremely right. independent. Well, I think I think that one of the things that women have come to our program for is instead of just a lot of women come to the program. You know how they? Well, I'd say one percent of our clients are women, but I would say that in terms of like whether or not we teach got women. I mean, women have come to our program not for necessarily like how to pick up guys, because yeah. I think that most women can pick up a guy. It's more about the social skills that you need to captivate people's interests and develop conversational skill sets. So we've had women that have come through our program. We've even had celebrity women come through our program. Um, like we had one girl who was um, Isis the Amazon. I think she was like the third tallest woman in the history of mankind. And uh, if you Google her, she's, she has a, a Hustler profile in Hustler Magazine, and she has a video on YouTube with her being up three guys at the same time and um, in a wrestling ring. But uh, <laughs> girls were afraid of her. You know, so she wanted to learn how to build female friendships and rapport with women. But at the same time, the same skill sets you can develop with, with rapport with anyone can be used to approach anyone for anywhere for any reason whatsoever. So we did a program for SAI, uh, the Personal Success Institute. It used to be um, one of the subsidiaries of Mind Dynamics, which broke off into Landmark and SAI. And we did an event for SAI where we did how to approach anyone anywhere for any reason. The same skill sets that we teach in RSD can be applied for anything. So I create a program called RC Founders Club. We talk about the parallels between pickup and how these analogies work for business. And I've done a lot of videos on YouTube about that. So some of the things that we talk about is how in, say, dating, you know, that mindsets you need to have in terms of how you view yourself in relationship to other people and how whether or not you should rely on other people is the ability to develop an interdependent outcome. If you're not dependent on someone, you're not completely independent of all other socializing, but you're working with other people that create win-win situations so you have healthy relationships as opposed to not. And you utilize that in business and pretty much every aspect of your life. Um, a great book about interdependent relationships, I think, is Seven Habits of High Effective People by Stephen Covey. It's my favorite book, so I recommend it to everyone. Everybody should get that book, for sure. My, uh, Habits of High Effective People. Yeah, my dad had his board of uh, directors at DeVry, you know, they all went to a meeting where Stephen Covey himself taught before he passed away. I mean, you're all from Utah, and so you're probably very familiar with him and his work. Other, other things that have been useful is just the mindsets for success. You know, the process is going through that process of self-actualization, finding out your core identity, what you value about yourself, and how to convey those cool elements fast, quick, and easy. Because a lot of people, they don't know how to do that. They will get success with women or guys because they just don't know how to know who they are and how to convey those cool aspects of themselves, how to convey that, how to develop deep, deep rapport, hook people into their life, tell stories, and also more importantly, how to transform. So I had a guy who was a client who was like a billionaire oil mogul who was super awkward. He was so awkward in the club, he had more fun throwing ice at girls than walking up and talking to them. He was, he was super unusual. And I have this exercise where I say, I want you to draw who you think you are versus who other people think you are. It's the difference between your persona or who you are deep down as a core. So he drew a, one picture of who he thought he was, like, uh, and, and, and that picture was like a, a picture of 
a cave on an island with a dead dragon coming out of it and human skulls on spikes surrounding the cave. And I said, man, you gotta, you gotta really work on yourself first before you start picking up girls because girls are not, I mean, girls are not gonna be interested in you if you don't really know who you are deep down inside, not because of the picture, because he explained what was on the back. Because if I look at that picture, who else has that kind of picture that actually gets girls? Well, heavy metal rock stars, punk artists, maybe Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. He's a famous, famous uh, music artist, and he would sing about crazy stuff. He probably has a similar picture, Marilyn Manson. These guys have that. But if you look at his picture he had of himself on the opposite side, it was him by himself all alone, like crying. He felt like he was by himself, had you know massive amounts of money, but he didn't really have a lot of respect for himself. And then... The, what we always talk about is bridging the congruency gap between who you think you are and who you are deep down inside. Because when you can convey that, you have that inner strength and you're more likely to convey that trust in yourself as opposed to something else. A lot of people make a lot of money conveying a persona. So someone is asking you, how do you convey that fancy persona to captivate people and what happens when they really get to know you? I'm like, well, your goal is for when they get to know you, they really do get to know you for you. You say exactly what's on your mind all the time. Now, I, I prefer doing all these crazy things like fanciful parties and whatever, whether it's at the Playboy Mansion or my house. I might have crazy video game parties. For example, I had an orchestra come from New York and play all the music from Legend of Zelda, bought everything from Etsy that said The Legend of Zelda on it, created Lost Woods, had foods from the game like potion stations and chicken. And every next month, a different theme with a crazy thing, maybe a blues theme, like a blues band, blue. One of the things that, for example, works <laughs> well with our company that you guys um, might want to do, and we did this, remember, John, a few, like, few months ago, is where you guys had, you know, by the way, everything that you guys are, are listening to, one of the things that, if you understand the message, ask yourself, how can I do this in my own business? One of the things that we do, right, for example, we do that extremely successful is when we do the wine and wealth parties. I mean, you have like 10 times more the people, right? And they're coming out and they're, because people love events. And I'm going to go ahead and talk about what I actually do and how I've been able to build a, a, a network myself to be able to do that. My other question to you is, um, Based on what you know, based on what you've seen, what's the hardest thing for somebody to overcome when they become an entrepreneur, right? Like when they've never become an entrepreneur. By by the way, any questions that we have, make sure that they apply to you, like apply to the business and how you can go ahead and actually how you can implement that in yourself. Does that make sense? Because that's but this is more of a business talk, not so much about just you know the, mm -hmm. everything else. So. Yeah, I mean when I was when I was in my MBA programs. Mm -hmm. I was always looking at what they were talking about and thinking, you know, how does this apply to me? So if I was talking about, say, operations, I might be running a guideline of my own internal operations and yep. building a tour. Um, when people were talking about marketing, I'd be writing some notes about features and benefits and defining the difference between, you know, what the product is versus like how it helps them as a customer and the, the benefits. So if, I heard, together. so if I heard Nick talking about like how he does this wild, you know, parties, you might tell yourself, well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, that's what I was hoping but, to explain. Right, right. <laughs> so, I mean, I wasn't explaining the parties because I, I, I like those as things that everyone should do. I just am addicted to that creative process. But on, but on a more like reasonable scale, most of my time wasn't these monthly large events. I would have dinner events or lunches and every time I would do something, I would never eat alone. So, I mean, if you want to throw elaborate parties, they can. But my basic goal is just never eat alone. I mean, yeah. in terms of pickup, you know, I would just walk up to random people and say, hey, what's up? I don't like eating alone. I'd like to join you. My name's Nick. You know, and, you know, if you're okay with me joining you, you know, share some time with you. And then we would just start talking. And share some stories. I would do that for guys, girls, anyone. It'd be That's mastermind groups. Like, hey, I don't want to eat alone. Yeah. But then I would follow up. Simple. But then I'd yeah. follow up. So then I'd follow up and I would do it again and again and again. Now, once I have a large group, my thing is, okay, great. Now I can't invite like you know 30 people to a restaurant. Well, I just have them in my house or invite them to a restaurant um, but I, or, or a coffee shop or like a bar. Bars are best, especially hotel bars because now you can rent out basically the whole venue. You go to like a hotel bar, it's like for free. You go to like the, the Hilton, no one goes to that bar unless you're a hotel guest and hotel guests don't like staying in the hotel. So you go there and you just invite like, you know, 100 people, 50 people. Uh, you know, 10% show up, you know, then start buying a few hundred people. 10% show up, you got 30 to 50 people. That's, that's how you build network. It's, 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 yeah, you got a free venue. And by the way, just so you guys That's know, how I did my business. That's how I grew. When it, when it comes to the business, the, the, the media and stuff like that, if you guys are 
um, seeing that, it's believe it or not, actually a lot of people that that I know that we're friends with have come through your seminars and will really learn the skills that you need in business and also how to meet your a, a great relationship. In fact, yeah, the, due to your skills, that's how you were able to meet your wife, Amber. Yeah, I, I would I would say in terms of like our client base, a lot of people are always like, hey, who, who attends your events? Well. You know, are they all like nerdy guys? Some of them are, but some of them are just players. Some of them are successful. I mean, our first uh, event, we had founders of PayPal, founders of other fortune companies, and all sorts of really interesting people because they're interested in this topic, you know? Right, it's like I mean, how to better do stuff, right? And then and it's a skill set. Yeah, I used the skill set of cold walk-ups. I met my wife walking down Main Street in Park City. You know, she was just with a friend. I invited her to sushi down the street. I knew she was going to go to what was known as Harry O's. A lot of you guys have been there. And uh, I had a table there, and it was for, I think, a Hoobastank. They had a concert out there. And uh, I said, well, hey, are you going to that club right there right now? Because if you are, it's not where you want to go right now. It's dead. Instead, you should come and have some sushi with me. We're going to a really awesome place. I came from California. At the time, I was living in L.A., you know, and I came from California, and my friends and I are going to have a really good time. Why don't you come join us? And then she said yes, and then we uh, spent the night having a great time. Or remind me to talk to you about following your money. Please. Okay. Go ahead, Amanda. Oh. Yeah, a lot of people are talking about multitasking. I know that's a big challenge for my wife. She had to cut out a lot of stuff in her life because she wanted to build a real estate video production company, go to Harvard as, as a full-time student, and also create a video game stream on Twitch for um, Team Liquid, which is like the highest monetized video game team for like Clash Royale. Because we have a lot of friends in like the video game world. In fact, last weekend I was at Steve Aoki's house doing a video production for his uh, Call of Duty stream. He actually, he's on there too. You know? So if you have kids that are into video games, don't worry about that. But I mean. A lot of people are always concerned about multitasking versus focus. I mean, for me, I, I liked the idea originally of getting involved with a lot of different things. And when I found my passion, because I did internships with everyone from high levels of politics to business. And if you uh, are finding like a career, you want to really dedicate yourself to it, you need to focus on that. So, I mean, for me, and I was in building my business for the first three to five years, I think in the first three years, it's 90% of businesses just went out of steam and disappeared 99% within five years because the people don't put time and effort into building it. And as a result, you have to put that focus in there. Now, if you want to, um, you know, you don't have that passion, you don't have that fire, and you could spend more time multitasking, but you really need to put your focus on one thing at a time. Now, me now, I built a system that was automated. Now, from the very beginning, I had that as my number one focus. Not because I didn't want to work, I want to retire as early as Adam did. <laughs> But Adam came back because he got bored. And I think that he wanted to work, right? You know? But I mean, you, me, you retired. I mean, when I, when, I, when I met you, you didn't do anything. <laughs> then, you, then you built a company and made a lot of money again. But <laughs> I, I know that because I basically retired for a year and a half we also. Out, we would hang out in the South in Vegas every day, just chill, hang out, watch movies. It's so funny. They would have all kinds of different like CEOs from different companies, multimillionaires, princes, and all this kind of things from the people coming out from Dubai and everywhere else just to hang out. And uh, it's really crazy. But at one point, it is true. Like I was actually, I remember I told you this, right? I was like, man, I don't want to vegetate on your couch anymore. We should actually go and do something. <laughs> so he went off and he started creating his YouTube channel. And then I was like, you know why I think we should make a lot of million people millionaires through really tap through it. He's like, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I want to have like a thousand people making a million dollars a year. He's like, well, you can do it. And we just, we started it. And that's the thing that happens, right? Now, now you're wearing this lion ring. Right. And originally, didn't you have like lion in your name? Right, right. What was it called again? Lion something? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but okay, so um, I, I guess what I was trying to convey though was like I had a, I had a mentor. He created internet marketing He actually was like the godfather of internet marketing. He died in a car accident because Corey he was Rural. teaching race car driving. Corey Rural. Yep. And he has this Bible. I don't know if it's available for sale anymore. You might be able to find it on eBay. It was called Insider's Secret of Internet Marketing. It was like a thousand-page guide of internet I marketing. Yeah, I think I gave you a copy, right? 
Yeah, so basically it's an awesome program about how to do it on the internet, how to build the businesses in person, face to face, but how to do it on the online way. That's, that's also a huge undertaking. But the concept of, behind it wasn't that because you're in internet marketing, you should systematize. It's because you systematize in order to get success in business, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're working in a team. In fact, um, Drew Morrissey here, he has a YouTube channel called How to Rap, and he's trying to build his business. And so I gave him EOS, which is a book called Traction by a guy named Gino Wickman. And it's about a system of how to manage your metrics and KPIs and how to automate your system for companies that are in the you know, range of less than $10 million. And then when you, when you and I thought that was a great book, you know, it was a, it was the key to my success to build our company in ten million dollars. And I think that I, for most people who have teams that are doing less than ten million a year in revenue, I think that's an awesome book for you guys to manage your metrics and what have you. But the idea is that you systematize so you have more free time. Then you can multitask. Then you could instead of just focusing on your business, have a life. I think everyone should have, you know, a life. But if you want to accelerate that process, you can do what I did, which is go to pure hustle mode. I sacrificed everything. Dude, I, I, I was going to talk about that. I sacrificed everything myself in the very beginning. And uh, I, it was what I listened to. It was my life. It was what I did. And I paid the price and people were thinking I'm crazy. And this is those same people that, you know, that are now business-wise non-existent. Yeah, so, uh, happiness sacrificed. Friends sacrificed. Yep. Family sacrificed. Um, whether it's uh, reunions or whether it was, uh, you know, any spare time for fun or social hedonism, everything disappeared. I was just focusing on one thing, you know, getting a situation that was financially solvent, power, the money, and it didn't matter. I mean, when I wanted to recover from the recession, I sent out an email to, uh, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of random people from the internet, and I said, I'd like, if you like my company, I would like to crash on your couch while I travel around the world teaching free seminars. And if you want to help me get from city to city, volunteer your car to drive with me from city to city. And I had a thousand people volunteer. And I crashed and I spent on average $2,700 a month while I went around every continent except for Antarctica. And I went to every city that American Airlines Delta United fly to and uh, did, a, did a free seminar in every city that, of those that have over a million people. I chose those because I'm like, well, if American-based airlines fly to them, people there speak English. That's all I speak, so I might as well fly there. And if people actually sign up for my free program, they can understand what I say. And because I know I can sell to anybody anything, then I'm ready to go. And that's the key. If you have the skill set to develop rapport with people, relationships, trust, credibility, you entertain them, tell them interesting stories, get them to like you for you, as opposed to just liking your product or your service, maybe liking both, hooking them in, showing that you can offer value to life, understanding their passions, pushing forward, you have enough inside yourself to do anything. You just need to be in front of people and you make money. I invested in my company because of the intelligence of the people, their ability to sell, add value to people's lives, not the product and service. The product and service is world class and gold standard of our industry. You know, we have a monopoly in our industry, but, but we have that passion. We have that work ethic. So, I mean, if you have that work ethic, that's how you're gonna you know, excel. It doesn't necessarily take like forever to do that. You just have to have a few years of pain. But if you're willing to do that, you can push through. I mean, there's a lot of risk involved when you're on these entrepreneurial ventures, like the one you guys are all in. Um, but if you push things forward, you can make a lot more money than those people who have those regular salary jobs. And the money that I was making back then was at a lower contract than what you could even get in this company. Inferior products, inferior companies, and we talked about that too, when we were talking about like building Elite Hathaway, as far as what we would have, it was something like, man, how do I really get something that it can scale up, not just for me, like it was, at this point, me and Nick can, you know, the, the lifestyle that we lived for years, it was more like really insane, right? But it's like, how do we scale this for people? How do we make it so that people can really build something where they can feel proud of and, and, and build it up in a huge way? And that's why we're doing it. Even with the videos that we're doing right now, it's not just here. It's ways where we can go ahead and get access to a lot of people, which is something that you guys will hopefully learn how to do. Um, one last question. Thank you very much for uh, coming and sharing with us. My question is a personal question. I have spent most of my life working for someone. 
You mentioned earlier that you lived in a parking lot in an airport to build your business. And I'm sure there were many days that you wondered why I left here. What were the tools that you used to pick yourself up in those times when you were really struggling emotionally to get past that barrier of the All right, so your question is, when I was living in a parking lot, wondering why I was here, what did I use to push forward? Well, when I was in a parking lot, I had a statistical analysis in my head of saying, hey, look, I, I think likely if I give it my all, I won't fail. I wasn't wondering why I was here. I kind of knew why I was there. I was there because I spent more money than I had, growing the company faster than it should have been. And as a result, now we have more managed growth because that was something that I didn't know, I didn't understand. I was obsessed with figuring that out. And that was a problem I you know, very recently figured out how to manage growth very, very fast. You know, it's not like I had a team of venture capitalists investing in my company, giving me money to start my company. It was all grassroots grown without any uh, family money being invested to grow it, same as Adam. So, I mean, it wasn't a situation where it was wondering why I got here. It was like, what do I do to get out of this? Because I'll do whatever it takes. I don't care what I have to do to, you know, make it happen. You know, it's like if you watch those action movies, so I'm always inspired by the hero. The hero is willing to sacrifice everything to save the world, like James Bond. You know, you sacrifice everything, no matter what it is. And so that was the mentality I had. You know, I think I've been inspired more by movies than, than books. That's why I always mention movies. I, my, my business partner reads a book like every week. But I, I'm more inspired by movies. So my, my, my goal was to figure out a game plan that financially would work. So I'd look at the numbers. I was like, well, these are the numbers I have to hit to get it. If I work this many hours while I hit it, well, I mean, I have nothing else but work, so let's, let's do it. Let's make things happen. And I, it wasn't like I, ha I reached out to anyone either. I wasn't reaching out. I just had to think really creatively. I mean, sometimes if you don't have that creative thought process, I'm lucky I have an artistic mom who was uh, always giving me in terms of thinking outside the box, creating art out of, out of newspapers and turning it into a, a Chinese lion dragon head and, and just crazy things like that. And so I was always thinking creatively. So if you, if you don't have that, brainstorm off people. I mean, I also had a... MBA program. I was in school at the time, but I was looking at a situation where I knew I could get out of it if I just put in the time, put in the work, and th thought creatively. So for that, I put um, my my <coughs> last money into the investment and trust of a friend. His name was Gunjan, and he was at the time a management consultant for Deloitte, and he, he didn't want to charge me anything. But what I needed to do was create a game plan. So I went over my credit card limit, and I I flew him and myself to visit my business partner living in Hawaii at the time. And we spent three days going over a, a board meeting process where we kind of bounced all ideas off of self. It isn't good to have ideas bounced off someone else. And so he acted as a mediator to find out what the difference were in terms of my vision and his vision. Now, Owen's vision was to create a company that inspired and influenced as much people as possible. Mine was to create a global company with power and influence and money that was you know, big. And they kind of align in terms of each other. And what we had to do was create a game plan for that to happen. And we would fight about who would do what, what would happen, how we use the resources we had. Because we had good incoming revenue. We just had really bad profits. So we did a few things. Some of them was we delayed payroll for like months. <laughs> well, if I'm not getting paid, you're not getting paid. But the other thing we did is we also... That's not ever going to happen to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> We actually legally cannot do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I say months, it was like a, a month and a half, right? Oh, okay. But not for everyone, just for like people that were willing to allow that to happen. For other people, longer though. And then for other people, we said, well, if you're willing to work for free, that'd be awesome. And we had 200 people that would work for free, 20 to 40 hours a week or longer. And then we had other people who said, well, I could pay you one day out of the week. The other four, you could work for free. And other people would work four days out of the week. And one day, you know, well, four days they would work for pay and then one day uh, for free or not at all. And then when we created a situation, those who stuck around, we, you know, massively increased their income, multiplied it, you know, multiples full of what they got paid. And now they're the C level executives in my company. Now they're all like, yeah, they're all doing extremely yeah. well. It's crazy. And they're making a lot of money. But um, we had to get people that bought into our vision. And I said, here's the game plan that we're going to do. If you're okay with this, stay involved. If not, bounce. But uh, either way, we love you. 
And uh, you know, we I take care of our people, and those core people who stayed around are making a lot of money. And so I mean, these are these are things I had to push forward. Now this is because I already had a team, you know, and that's that's the situation I was in. Now in situations where we had, I mean, from the very beginning I had a team. I mean, I had I always had at least two other people traveling with me wherever I went, you know, trying to create this company. We used the internet to figure out what people wanted. It was funny if you guys ever see his. Uh, a lot of you, it's so funny. I, I get a lot of people that get hung up on like logos and companies or like, you might, you see that, right? Like, I don't have a perfect logo yet. I don't have a website. It's almost like, I don't have a license and I don't have, I don't have the knowledge to do it, right? It's so funny because of the fact that even with Elite Hathaway, we didn't even really have a logo or a website and we were already producing thousands of dollars of business. Just like you and your website, you had literally like a drawn by like almost seemed like a five-year-old website. <laughs> yeah, no, he's, he's being literal. So I, I, I didn't really have a lot of artistic skills, but I had Microsoft Paint. So I had, a, I drew a picture of myself as a stick figure and uh, you know, a circle, a line, leg. And then I, I wrote, uh, these are uh, names of random anonymous pickup artists that I'm traveling around the world meeting. None of which I assume they even know who they are. I said, but what I am doing is I'm dedicating my you know, $60,000 traveling around, meeting guys solely to focus on picking up girls. And um, if you want to uh, meet with me, I'd love to meet with you. And then I would send this to random people on the internet who were too afraid to give out their real name because at the time, uh, pickup artists were meeting on discussion boards on a website that doesn't exist anymore because they're too afraid to let other people know that they're studying how to pick up girls because they thought that their ego would be bruised. It's a huge community. <laughs> I had no idea. And you know what's crazy about Nick is the fact that he's been able to build a whole industry, not just a company. Like the industry that you created doesn't it really, yeah. didn't really exist and it's completely underground. It's insane. Yeah, we took uh, a bunch of uh, anonymous looking websites that look sketchy and turned it into a company that has us with millions of people following us on the internet. Yeah. Every day of the week, we release like an hour of video somewhere on a YouTube channel with our real faces showing our guys picking up girls to start to fish hidden cameras that are pretty badass. Nice. <laughs> well, guys, I, uh, any, any last minute thoughts, feelings? I, I mean, I appreciate you being here and uh, we've been friends for a long time and I hope a lot more time now. And I appreciate you coming out here and spending the time. Yeah, I appreciate with, you, uh, man. You've done so much for my life and it's been awesome to have you as a friend. Yep, absolutely. And uh, I'm really going to build this billion dollar company. And uh, you know that, and I know that, and our friends know that. So yeah. we're going to go out and go all the way. Thanks so much. Good cool. Work, Thanks. Cheers. Woo!